Welcome back to Environmental Epidemiology. And in this video, we're going to focus on cross-sectional studies. A lot of it will be a review, and we're going to also include some information on a relatively new cross-sectional study that may be of interest to you in light of current events. With that said, in this image, you can see the WeChat logo right there. And then around it is some folks practicing social distancing. And if you don't know what WeChat is, WeChat is the equivalent of Snapchat and Facebook kind of blended together in the Chinese population because the Chinese government does not permit them to have Snapchat or Facebook for various reasons, some of which relate to their national security and perceptions about our national security, and I'll just leave it at that. So in this video, we're going to focus on a quick review at first. So moving forward. So you already know that snapshot studies are the cross-sectional kind. These are studies that are conducted over a short period of time. There is no follow-up period. And the unit of analysis is the individual. So we gather information from people one time. And we don't go back and contact them later because that follow-up would then suggest it's longitudinal or what we might call a cohort study. So we survey people at random or we gather people at random and then we interview them or we collect samples from them one time. And it all comes from the individual level and we can do the analysis at the individual level. And the goal of these studies to just gather information at a snapshot in time can include ascertaining the current disease status of the population. How many people currently have the coronavirus? Um, how many people are smokers? How many people have ever had cancer or have ever had skin cancer? How many people work in healthcare? You can interview people about those types of things and get answers, all right? You may also be interested in asking questions about the current determinants of health, which could include socioeconomic factors or even things that are behavioral, like smoking and that kind of stuff. And the data are obtained as prevalence data at the individual level. So that gives us the ability to potentially estimate prevalence odds ratios, which may be useful for risk determination. So when we do our studies, we have to do a uh, study based upon some sort of reference population. So if we're going to do our cross-sectional study in an ideal sitting, setting, we will randomly obtain our sample from a reference population. So there's a variety of different methods to randomly sample a large population. And then from each individual, you can then get their individual information. And the examples that we gave in class are the BRFSS, that's Behavior Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, or the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey, or NHANES. And you heard me say in class already, I don't like the way that Burfus and Yerbus sound, but if you work for a health department, you may hear them refer to BRFSS or YRBS as Burfus and Yerbus, just like I referred to NHANES as that as opposed to N-H-A-N-E-S. So those are, and I joked in the class that Burfus and Yerbus would be good professional wrestling names or something. All right, so for our example for the class on the uh, coronavirus situation is to potentially, um, you know, spend some time here looking at a cross-sectional study that focuses on a, psycholo a psychological outcome. And not just one psychological outcome, they actually looked at anxiety disorder, depressive symptoms, and sleep quality during the epidemic in China. And this is not in a peer-reviewed journal yet. It is on this system called Med Archive. And that's the Greek letter Chi from like Chi Omega, like the sorority, or from Chi, like a Chi-square test. So it's the Greek letter Chi, so Med Archive. And this is a place for researchers to get information um, as they're thinking about publishing their manuscripts 
as well as while their manuscripts may actually be undergoing review. So a lot of activity is happening on their particular uh, server right now where people are reading the most current stuff. Some of it's garbage, some of it's good, a lot of it's really good actually. So just a little um, background on their example study or the one that I'm presenting here. So several studies that were done during the SARS outbreak of 2003 that happened in Hong Kong and Toronto and a few other places around the world showed that healthcare workers and SARS survivors had some mental health effects and um, they were interested in this study looking at doing a web-based cross-sectional study to look at the mental health burden of the Chinese population during the COVID-19 epidemic. And they want to see what factors may influence that uh, those mental health outcomes. So this is what they were up to. So they want to look at the mental health burden of the Chinese population during the COVID-19 epidemic to try to see what factors may have been influential. And that information is useful to share because other communities around the world and countries around the world can use that information. So how did they do their study? Well, they report that they used a web-based cross-sectional survey, which makes sense. You don't want to be going to people's houses door to door in the middle of a pandemic, or at that case, maybe an epidemic in their country. And they used a existing survey, the National Internet Survey on Emotional and Mental Health. So they used that survey to um, ask the questions, at least, to put the questions into their web app. They did the web survey, and uh, before they did it though, they needed to recruit people. And in order to recruit people, they had to advertise. So their English is different than ours a little bit. They said so they broadcast it on the internet. So they tried to recruit through the internet and they used WeChat. So you can think of like Snapchat or Facebook advertisements, encouraging people to click on the link. And they also used the Chinese media, so it's state-run media, the news stations over there. So they advertised their study in that way, and the study was approved by an ethics committee at uh, this uh, Huazong University and uh, the affiliated with the uh, Shenzhen Hospital. So they got the approval to actually do their survey. And it's a cross-sectional study, so they're surveying the general population. They used WeChat from got information from all these different types of people. But I ask, do you see any design flaws? Is it okay just to advertise on Facebook or on Snapchat that you're doing a survey and anybody can participate? How will that go? Who will actually read the advertisement? Who will click? on the advertisement. So is it truly random or not? That's a design flaw and I'm not for sure if they've clearly articulated in the paper how they overcome that challenge. It's one thing to provide people a unique identifier and uniquely randomly identify people to participate. It's another thing just to advertise to everyone you can participate because then your response bias of who's choosing to participate or who your volunteers are to do the survey may not actually reflect the true Chinese population. So in their paper, they provide a lot of results. The results actually come from over 7,236 individuals, but the major part of the result, like many of your scientific papers that you'll be presenting on for this class, are in one of the, the latter tables where all the action is. And this is the results of their univariate, which are your crude odd ratios. And this is a misnomer, not multivariate, but multivariable logistic regression. So, and that gives them their adjusted odds ratios. So we're gonna look more closely at this just because you might be curious as to what they found out. So what did they find out? What was a risk factor for general anxiety disorder or depression? Apparently, um, it looks like the women were at a slightly increased, um, you know, risk or had a slightly increased odds of reporting um, general anxiety and depression, but it did not achieve statistical significance. And that was 7,000 people 
responding. So um, we're okay there. There's probably not much of a difference between male and female. But among people under 35, big differences there. The odds ratio and the adjusted odds ratios are, are strongly significant. You notice that one is not included. So there's anywhere between a 49% and a 102% increased odds of general anxiety disorder. The actual uh, estimate of general anxiety disorder for age says that there's a 65% increased odds of having general anxiety disorder among those under 35 years of age. And then in depression, when we look at the adjusted odds ratio for depression, it's all significant. People under 35 had an increased risk or an increased you know, reporting frequency of having depressive symptoms in people over 35. In fact, the odds are 77% higher for the people under 35 than over 35. Next, let's look at occupation. And you see nothing in bold because everything on this slide as it relates to healthcare workers, institution workers, teachers, everything in bold is not, nothing here is in bold. So one is included in all of these confidence intervals. Nothing is statistically significant in this uh, particular um, part of table five. So let's look at this part of table five. I've cut table five up in pieces so you can see it. Here, time to focus on the COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic now. And people who had more than three hours of time to focus on it reported a 91% increased odds or an adjusted odds of 83% increased odds of having general anxiety disorder. They weren't depressed, but they had more anxiety. We have the prevalence incidence bias, the which came first bias here in this study. Is it the anxiety making them watch it for three or more hours to get wound up? Or is it by watching it for three hours causing them to get wound up? This is not a cohort study, so we don't know which happened first, the anxiety or the watching it for three or more hours. But there is an association there between the two. And the knowledge of the virus didn't really seem to affect the general anxiety disorder or the depressive symptoms. But there is a relationship between the amount of time people spend watching or focusing on this and general anxiety, according to their paper. And then in terms of sleep quality, no differences in sleep quality between male and females during the um, quarantine period that they were dealing with in China, except for healthcare workers. For healthcare workers, we saw a 32% increased odds of having poor sleep quality. That didn't affect teachers or enterprise workers or other people. Um, so when they're comparing healthcare workers, enterprise workers, and teachers versus the rest of the population, no increased loss in sleep quality. So these types of studies are great because we can get individual level data. We can try to adjust for potential confounders. In this case, they're adjusting for gender. Um, these are short term. They can be done very quickly. We can do them online, hopefully at random. So that's a flaw of that particular study that you just watched or looked at. Some other advantages, um, if they sample from a generalizable population, um, we might be able to draw conclusions that may inform us for others. And we have the possibility to estimate risk or, the, you know, it, or, or at least um, show a connection or a potential um, hypothesis for, for risk elevation through the calculation of the prevalence odds ratio, which is obtained traditionally, as you know from previously in this class, through logistic regression. And the, one of the problems is that sometimes, you know, it's hard to tell which is first, you know, the antecedent or the consequence. So um, if you can know which is first, you might be able to do a better job of estimating risk. But in this case, we don't know that. We cannot determine which happened first, the anxiety or them watching TV for three hours about the disease.
Um, in this case, we don't have a problem with anxiety being rare, so that's not a problem for this particular design. But it may be a design that's at risk of the response bias. Who chose to respond back to the survey? And it could be that the more educated people were more likely to respond than less educated folks. You know, we don't know. It could be that this study that we looked at is a more rosy picture than reality. The healthiest and maybe happier people may have been more likely to respond to a WeChat survey. Or it could be the other way around. The more sad and depressed folks who were on their phones and saw a study about anxiety said, you know what, I need to click on that and see if I can learn about how to make myself, you know, get out of this, this slump and uh, or help other people not get like me. So maybe people ended up doing the survey for that reason. We don't know. There's a response bias problem that may exist. So moving forward into the next slides, we're going to look at some future needed cross-sectional studies that should be getting done or hopefully are going to be getting done in the very near future that looks at the serology or the immunological responses of people to the coronavirus that's upon us. And this will be helpful for us in trying to quote open up the economy or for just better protecting ourselves and our friends and for healthcare workers to be more on the front lines or not of this epidemic. So we'll discuss that more in a future video. So if you have any questions or comments, again, um, you can always email me at jason.marion.eku.edu. And you've also got my phone number for texting and calling as needed. All right. Well, I hope you have the rest of your day. I um, uh, hope the rest of your day goes really, really well. So that is all for now.